Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. This time in Communism for Beginners, we are obviously continuing with Lenin's left-wing communism and infantile disorder. And we are in chapter 7, I believe. Should revolutionaries work in reactionary trade unions? This is a pretty short chapter. There's still an incredible amount of depth in this. Almost in every paragraph, there's all kinds of deeper and more complicated ideas that Lenin is introducing or is referring to, but he doesn't fully go into them. Also, happy May 1st. I'm recording this a little bit before May 1st, but this should come out around that time. So, should revolutionaries work in reactionary trade unions? Lenin says, quote, the German lefts consider that as far as they are concerned, the reply to this question is an unqualified negative. In their opinion, declamations and angry outcries, such as uttered by K. Horner in a particularly, quote-unquote, solid and particularly stupid manner against reactionary and counter-revolutionary trade unions, are sufficient proof that it is unnecessary and even inexcusable for revolutionaries and communists to work in yellow, social chauvinist, compromising and counter-revolutionary trade unions of the Legion type. So first, let's deal with the terminology a little bit. The German lefts, they are left communist or so-called left communists. These days, obviously, left communism is used slightly differently. My understanding is that there's basically two main types of left communism. There's the sort of ultra-democratic one that sometimes leans towards anarchism, and then there's the sort of commandist or anti-democratic sort of bordigaist left communism. Lenin here isn't really talking about either one of those. The way he uses this term is that he simply means ultra-leftists, even though here he's specifically talking about German ultra-leftists. The next question that might occur to you is, well, okay, so if he's talking about ultra-leftists, what the hell is an ultra-leftist? I've covered that in previous episodes, so I'm not going to go into that uh, in any detail, but I'll just say that it's um, basically a type of opportunism, which, instead of making too many compromises, it's a type of opportunism that is just so extremist that it's completely out of touch with reality. Yellow trade unions, as far as I know, are just trade unions which make compromises with the bourgeoisie and always uh, give in to what the capitalists want. So the main idea here, obviously, is that the ultra-leftists, or in this case, the German left communists, they claim that revolutionaries and communists should never work in what they consider to be reactionary and counter-revolutionary and yellow trade unions. So if the trade unions are compromising, communists should not belong to those. Communists should not work in those. What does Lenin think about that? Well, let's keep reading. He says, quote, However firmly the German lefts may be convinced of the revolutionism of such tactics, the latter are in fact fundamentally wrong and contain nothing but empty phrases. To make this clear, I shall begin with our own experience in keeping with the general plan of the present pamphlet, which is aimed at applying to Western Europe whatever is universally practicable, significant and relevant in the history and the present-day tactics of Bolshevism, unquote. So Lenin certainly doesn't have a very high opinion of left communism. He thinks that it's just completely stupid. It's just the most idiotic thing in the world. And it contains nothing but empty phrases. There's a lot of sloganeering in ultra-leftism. Ultra-leftists like to make all these big statements and these big declarations. They like to declare how revolutionary they are. But it's all just empty words. It doesn't mean anything. There's no substance to it. And I just wanted to point out that Lenin says that what this book is trying to talk about or trying to do is to discuss Bolshevik theory and Bolshevik tactics and Bolshevik experience which applies universally. So even though different countries have different things and some revolutions happen at different times than others, there are still certain ideas and certain things which are universally applicable. So Lenin begins by talking about the role of the trade unions in Soviet Russia. It was Soviet Russia at the time, later it became the Soviet Union when uh, a bunch of other republics joined it. Lenin says, quote, In Russia today, 
The connection between leaders, party, class and masses, as well as the attitude of the dictatorship of the proletariat and its party to the trade unions are concretely as follows. The dictatorship is exercised by the proletariat organized in the Soviets. The proletariat is guided by the Communist Party of the Bolsheviks. And I'm already going to stop there, because that's significant. There are two ideas that he lays out. The dictatorship of the proletariat is exercised by the proletariat organized in the Soviets. So that's one. They have a dictatorship of the proletariat. How does it take place? How is it organized? It's organized in the form of Soviets to which the workers belong and which the workers control. And then the second idea he introduces is that the proletariat is guided by the Communist Party of Bolsheviks. So the proletariat is the ruling class. It's the dictatorship of the proletariat, but the proletariat has the guidance and is under the guidance of the Communist Party of Bolsheviks. Both of those are super important. Both of those are necessary. It's not a dictatorship of the Communist Party, it's a dictatorship of the working class. But at the same time, the working class needs the Communist Party and must be under the ideological guidance and ideological leadership of the Communist Party. It's not actually possible to carry out a successful proletarian revolution without a communist party. And it's also not possible to build socialism without the leadership of a communist party. So, okay, let's go more into detail. So how does that actually look like? So he says, quote, The party which holds annual congresses is directed by a central committee elected at the congress, while the current work in Moscow has to be carried on by still smaller bodies, known as the Organizing Bureau and the Political Bureau, which are elected at plenary meetings of the Central Committee. This, it would appear, is a full-fledged, quote-unquote, oligarchy. No important political or organizational question is decided by any state institution in our republic without the guidance of the party's Central Committee, unquote. So that's one side of the equation. So on the one side, you have the workers, and then on the other side of the equation, you have the party. So the party has congresses, the congresses elect a central committee, the central committee elects from its own midst an organizing bureau and a political bureau. And to an ultra-leftist, this must seem like an absolute oligarchy. There's like a hundred thousand party members who elect a central committee, which is like 20 members, and then they have a politburo, which is like five people. What an oligarchy, right? But Lenin just mocks that idea. He even adds fuel to the fire when he says that no important political or organizational question is decided by any state institution in our republic without the guidance of the party's central committee. Ooh, doesn't that sound so nefarious and sinister? Well, think about it. If there is some actually super important question regarding the state and regarding the country, could the Central Committee of the Communist Party actually ignore it? Well, of course not. They have to be involved in all the important decisions. That's their responsibility as revolutionaries. The goal is to build socialism, and the communists have an incredibly important role in trying to help and trying to organize that socialist construction, and eventually the construction of communism. The mission of the communists is to provide ideological guidance and ideological and political leadership to the working class and the working masses. That's their job. That's the job of communists. So that's the communists and the communist party. What about the actual working class? Let's talk about them now. So Lenin says, quote, In its work, the party relies on the trade unions, which have a membership of over 4 million and are formerly non-party. Actually, all the directing bodies of the vast majority of the unions are made up of communists, and carry out all the directives of the party. Thus, on the whole, we have a formally non-communist, flexible, and relatively wide and very powerful proletarian apparatus by means of which the party is closely linked up with the class and the masses, and by means of which, under the leadership of the party, the class dictatorship is exercised. Unquote. So the party at that time was about mm, between 100,000 and 200,000 members, while well, the trade unions have 4 million members. Of course, this was only in the very early stages of the Soviet uh, Revolution. Later on, the party was much bigger and the trade unions were also massively bigger. But at this early moment, 
the trade unions are about 4 million people. So Lenin states that the trade unions are really big and at least formally they are non-party. So they are not uh, any kind of communist trade union. It's just a trade union or just a bunch of different trade unions. But, as he says, actually the directing bodies of the vast majority of the unions are made up of communists. So he starts to bridge this gap. On one side you have the Communist Party and on the other side you have the proletariat and now he starts to bridge that gap. In the unions, which are non-party, all the leading trade unionists, all the most active and the best trade unionists, the most committed, most tenacious and hard-working trade unionists, what do you know? They're communists. And because they're communists, they carry out directives of the party. They follow the party's ideology, they follow the party's program. And as a result, they have a formerly non-communist, flexible and relatively wide and very powerful proletarian apparatus, by means of which the party is closely linked up with the class and the masses. So it's non-party, so it's outside the communist party, it's very broad, and it's very powerful, and it's a proletarian apparatus. Nobody can argue with that. It's a huge proletarian machine of millions of workers organized. And through that, the party is able to maintain close links and close ties with the working class and with the working masses, because the party, uh, of course, has its own program, but because the best trade unionists are uh, either members of the party or supporters of the party, through those trade unionists, the party has a big influence on the trade union. And by means of which, under the leadership of the party, the class dictatorship is exercised. But, very importantly, it happens under the leadership of the Communist Party. And how is that possible? Well, because the best trade unionists are communists. And then Lenin concludes this segment by saying, quote, Without close contacts with the trade unions and without their energetic support and devoted efforts, not only in economic but also in military affairs, it would, of course, have been impossible for us to govern the country and to maintain the dictatorship for two and a half months, let alone two and a half years, unquote. So, you know, if they didn't have the support of these millions of organized workers, they wouldn't have had any chance. So the party must maintain close contacts with trade unions, and the party must continually maintain its influence in the trade unions. How does that happen in actuality? Lenin says, quote, In practice, these very close contacts naturally call for highly complex and diversified work in the form of propaganda, agitation, timely and frequent conferences, not only with the leading trade union workers, but with influential trade union workers generally. They call for a determined struggle against the Mensheviks, who still have a certain though very small following, to whom they teach all kinds of counter-revolutionary machinations, ranging from an ideological defense of bourgeois democracy and preaching that the trade unions should be independent, that is, independent of the proletarian state power, to sabotage of proletarian discipline, etc., etc., unquote. So actually maintaining influence over the trade unions and maintaining these close contacts with the trade unions is of course very difficult and requires constant hard work. They have to produce propaganda, which in this case would be probably largely newspaper articles and uh, leaflets, a bit more thorough written material, agitation, which just means um, rallies, demonstrations, speeches, generally talking to people, saying, hey, remember this is what the communists were saying, we should do that, that kind of stuff and frequent conferences with leading trade union workers and influential trade union workers generally. So just trying to talk to the trade union workers, try to see what's up, what do they think, try to convince them that the communists are correct, or if the communists are wrong, then asking them, okay, so what do you think we should do, and then consider maybe doing that. Furthermore, they have to struggle against the Mensheviks, who are basically the uh, opportunist fake Marxist group in Russia at the time, what do the Mensheviks tell their followers? They tell their followers that instead of having a Soviet state, they should have a bourgeois state, and that the trade unions should be quote-unquote independent. What does that mean? It means that they shouldn't collaborate with the worker state, they shouldn't participate in projects and policies of the worker state, 
They shouldn't follow the instructions of the Communist Party or the proletarian state. That's what these so-called independent trade unions are. And that's a super common demand. There's tons of opportunist currents in socialist countries which have demanded that. They've, they've demanded that they need to have trade unions which are against the socialist state. Because that's what it really means. If they want to be independent, that doesn't mean that they're neutral. It just means that they are against the socialist state. Because if they were for the socialist state, then why the hell would they want to be independent from it? But then you have to ask, well, why would workers want to be against the socialist state? Why would they want to have a trade union that's against the socialist state? Well, in some circumstances, they could possibly get some short-term personal gain. And that's pretty much it. That's really the only motivating factor, is that they want some short-term personal gain at the expense of everybody else. Or they might just be so ideologically anti-communist that they do it out of principle. Although, typically, it's a combination of both. It could also just be that the supporters of the Mensheviks probably just weren't very politically literate. A politically conscious worker would obviously think what's best for society as a whole, what's best in the long term, instead of just wanting short-term personal gain. Lenin says, We consider that contacts with the masses through the trade unions are not enough in the course of our revolution, practical activities have given rise to such institutions as non-party workers and peasants conferences, and we strive by every means to support, develop, and extend this institution in order to be able to observe the temper of the masses, come closer to them, meet their requirements, promote the best among them to state posts, etc. Unquote. So, just having influence over the trade unions is not enough. They need even broader influence. So Lenin points out that in the course of their revolution, a new kind of institution that has arisen is the conference of non-party workers and peasants, which are basically just mass meetings of workers and peasants who are not members of the Communist Party. And the party tries to support those, make them bigger, make their work better. And what for? Well, firstly, to observe what do the people think, what do the masses think. What is the situation of the masses? What's their level of political knowledge at this point? And secondly, form closer contacts with them, because if you are able to understand the masses, then you can better serve their needs and thus win them over. And thirdly, to promote the best among them to state posts, to find workers, find peasants who are outside the Communist Party and promote them to leadership positions. Because even if this person is not a member of the Communist Party and potentially not even a communist, if they still support the worker state, if they support the policies of the worker state, and if they just genuinely support workers and peasants' rights, then this is a very good and useful person who should be put into a useful position. Of course, like in all situations, the party still needs to keep an eye on them so they don't just, like, go crazy all of a sudden or just turn out to be something completely different than what we expected, but if they seem to be a good, reliable person, then yeah, put them into a position of leadership. So Lenin concludes this um, first half of this chapter by saying, quote, such is the general mechanism of the proletarian state power, viewed, so to say, from above, from the standpoint of the practical implementation of the dictatorship. We hope that the reader will understand why the Russian Bolshevik, who has known this mechanism for 25 years, and has seen it develop out of small, illegal, and underground circles, cannot help regarding all this talk about from above or from below, about the dictatorship of leaders or the dictatorship of the masses, etc., as ridiculous and childish nonsense, something like discussing whether a man's left leg or right arm is of greater use to him." Unquote. In the previous chapter, which I talked about in episode 6, I believe, Lenin deals with this ultra-leftist idea that the revolution and everything always has to come from below, whereas if you have leaders and if you have a party, then it's somehow imposed from above. But it's a one-sided way of looking at things, when in reality, you need the masses and you need the party. You can't just have the party or the masses, you need both of them. 
And it's just a complete non sequitur to ask, oh, is this organized from below or from above? Well, it's both. Is this done by the leaders or the masses? Well, both. The masses need leaders, leaders need masses. The leaders come from the masses, the masses create leaders. So that's talking about mass organizations in Soviet Russia, but how about trade unions in capitalist countries? From that, we've already sort of got an idea of what the communists are supposed to do and how they're supposed to use mass organizations. So let's take a look how that applies to capitalist countries. So Lenin says, We cannot but regard as equally ridiculous and childish nonsense the pompous, very learned and frightfully revolutionary disquisitions of the German lefts to the effect that communists cannot and should not work in reactionary trade unions, that it is permissible to turn down such work, that it is necessary to withdraw from the trade unions and create a brand new and immaculate so-called workers' union, invented by very pleasant and probably for the most part very youthful communists, etc., etc. Unquote. Lenin's image of what an ultra-leftist is, is that there's somebody who's very immature, and there is probably some more general truth to that, because people tend to be very extreme, when they're younger, and then when they grow up, they sort of mellow out a little bit. But Lenin is also talking from experience, because when he was dealing with the Russian left communists, led by Nikolai Buharin and those guys, they always called him old, and he called them young, and whatever. So what exactly do the left communists want to do? Well, as Lenin states here, what the left communists want to do is they want to leave all the trade unions. They think, oh yeah, these trade unions, they're not for us. We have to leave them. We have to get out of them, withdraw from trade union work, and we have to create new revolutionary trade unions or purely communist trade unions. And what for? Because... The left communists think that trade unions make compromises and they are generally influenced by the bourgeoisie, so therefore you should create your own communist union and then, you know, since everybody is a communist, it's not going to have any bourgeois influence and it's not going to make any compromises to the bourgeoisie. Simple, right? Lenin says, quote, We can and must begin to build socialism not with abstract human material or with human material specifically prepared by us, but with the human material bequeathed to us by capitalism. True, that is no easy matter, but no other approach to this task is serious enough to warrant discussion. Unquote. And that really is the crux of the matter. We have to deal with the people that actually exist. We have to deal with the workers who actually exist, and the masses who actually exist. We have to deal with them the way they actually are, and not the way that we would like them to be. There's a problem with this ultra-leftist idea that, okay, this trade union is making compromises, and it's bourgeois, and yada yada, I don't like it, I'm gonna make my own trade union. Then you're not really changing the world, you're not influencing the masses to change, you're just refusing to participate with the masses. The left communists and the ultra-leftists, they're not effectively influencing the masses. Instead, they're kind of saying, if the masses don't correspond to my expectations, then I'm not going to work with them. And I realize that that's polemical. The ultra-leftists would not accept that statement. They would deny it. But that is how it is. And that's why Lenin basically calls them childish and says that uh, they're not serious. Lenin says, quote, The trade unions were a tremendous step forward for the working class in the early days of capitalist development inasmuch as they marked a transition from the workers' disunity and helplessness to the rudiments of class organization, unquote. Originally, the workers didn't have any kind of organization. They were just individual workers. They didn't have class consciousness, they didn't have organizations, but very slowly they started to form at least the rudiments of class consciousness and the rudiments of an organization, a very basic, primitive kind of organization, but still it was progress. He goes on, quote, When the revolutionary party of the proletariat, the highest form of proletarian class organization, began to take shape, and the party will not merit the name until it learns to weld the leaders into one indivisible whole with the class and the masses, the trade unions inevitably began to reveal certain reactionary features, a certain craft narrow-mindedness, a certain tendency to be non-political, 
a certain inertness, etc. Unquote. So Lenin sees the trade unions as a very low and very basic form of working class organization, but they're still a very important form of organization, and especially at the beginning, they set the bar low enough that basically almost any worker can join a union. That's a starting point. And then Lenin sees the Communist Party as the highest form of proletarian organization. So there are two different levels. Once you have a Communist Party, then of course, compared to the Communist Party, the trade union is going to look reactionary. Why? Well, because trade unions, they can be narrow-minded, they can have craft narrow-mindedness. That probably is not such a big problem anymore, at least in the Western industrialized countries. Craft narrow-mindedness basically just means that people don't identify with workers unless they are from the same craft. There used to be like coat makers unions and shirt makers unions and sock makers unions and whatever. And if somebody was like a sock maker, they would only support the interests of the people who make socks and they wouldn't support the interests of people who make shirts. But then later those all merged into just like big textile unions or something. So it's all the textile workers together. But then a situation might arise where you only support the interest of textile workers and you don't support the interest of metal workers. Well, eventually those would merge into even bigger unions or federations of unions or something like that, where ideally all workers from all unions and all kinds of jobs support all workers from all other jobs. I think these days, especially in the West, the unions and union federations are really big, so this craft narrow-mindedness is not really such a big problem, in my experience at least, uh, anymore. But uh, trade unions, they still have other potential problems. Of course, if if somebody only identifies with their trade union, they might still have a narrow-minded picture, they might not really understand politics. Uh, Lenin says that unions can have a certain tendency to be non-political, and that's because unions... They mostly just try to get higher wages and they try to improve conditions of workers and rights of the workers in the actual workplace. They typically focus on those kinds of things. They don't focus on political theory or even teaching people how the world works or anything like that, whereas the Communist Party obviously does. So yes, compared to the Communist Party, these trade unions do have a tendency to be non-political but Lenin concludes this idea by saying, quote, However, the development of the proletariat did not and could not proceed anywhere in the world otherwise than through the trade unions, through reciprocal action between them and the party of the working class, unquote. And I've talked about this before. Basically, the trade unions are a very natural type of organization. Almost anybody who has a job can join a trade union and immediately get into a very basic level of class struggle, and very basic level of political organizing. Most members of trade unions are not super active, they're pretty passive, but there are active trade union organizers, and for the communists, it's the most important to win over the active trade union organizers. So, to either have communist party members actually become trade union organizers, or recruit trade union organizers to be a members of the Communist Party, supporters of the Communist Party, or just support at least some policies of the Communist Party, or collaborate with the Communist Party. The Communist Party knows all about the theory and communism and Marxism and all that stuff, but they're a rather small group. But if they have the support of the organized workers, the trade unionists and the trade union activists and the trade union organizers, then through those guys, they can influence the whole, or at least almost the whole, trade union membership, which is a huge amount of people. And then, if there is a revolutionary situation, if there is, a, let's say, a general strike, or some kind of huge, some other revolutionary situation, and those organized workers get on the move, let's say that a good chunk of unionized workers get on the move, then they, in their turn, can influence even more people. They can influence an even bigger chunk of the population so that even workers who are not unionized and even 
non-proletarian working masses such as freelance people, uh, intellectuals, parents who stay at home, farmers or peasants, all kinds of those people who are not actually proletarians but they're still working, they're people who earn a living through work, they also get swept up into the revolutionary movement. They get activated and they get radicalized, at least for the time being. So Lenin's point is that even though trade unions are limited, and even though the criteria for somebody to join a trade union is very low, that's not really a problem. That's just the nature of the trade union. If you needed to be some kind of hardcore communist to join the trade union, well then it would almost defeat the whole purpose of having a trade union. Lenin says, quote, The proletariat's conquest of political power is a gigantic step forward for the proletariat as a class, and the party must more than ever, and in a new way, not only in the old, educate and guide the trade unions, at the same time bearing in mind that they are and will long remain an indispensable school of communism, and a preparatory school that trains proletarians to exercise their dictatorship an indispensable organization of the workers for the gradual transfer of the management of the whole economic life of the country to the working class, unquote. This is how Lenin sees the role of the trade unions in a Soviet state. The trade unions are supposed to get regular people involved in running society. That's why Lenin calls them a school of communism. Let's continue. Lenin says, quote, In the sense mentioned above, a certain so-called reactionism in the trade unions is inevitable under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Not to understand this means a complete failure to understand the fundamental conditions of the transition from capitalism to socialism. It would be egregious folly to fear this reactionism, or to try to evade or leap over it, for it would mean fearing that function of the proletarian vanguard which consists in training, educating, enlightening, and drawing into the new life the most backward strata and masses of the working class and the peasantry. Unquote. The whole task of the vanguard party is to educate the masses. That's why it's important to have an organization that is basic, so that it's a starting point. This is an important point. Lenin says that, quote, In countries more advanced than Russia, a certain reactionism in the trade unions has been and was bound to be manifested in a far greater measure than in our country. Our Mensheviks found support in the trade unions, and to some extent still do in a small number of unions, as a result of the latter's craft narrow-mindedness, craft selfishness, and opportunism. The Mensheviks of the West have acquired a much firmer footing in the trade unions. There, the selfish, case-hardened, covetous and petty bourgeois labor aristocracy, imperialist-minded and imperialist-corrupted, has developed into a much stronger section than in our country. That is incontestable. The struggle against the... And then he rattles off a bunch of uh, basically Western labor aristocrat, right-wing social democrat leaders, is much more difficult than the struggle against our Mensheviks. We are waging a struggle against the labor aristocracy in the name of the masses of the workers, and in order to win them over to our side, we are waging the struggle against the opportunist and social chauvinist leaders in order to win the working class over to our side. It would be absurd to forget this most elementary and most self-evident truth. Yet, it is this very absurdity that the German left communists perpetrate when, because of the reactionary and counter-revolutionary character of the trade union top leadership, they jump to the conclusion that we must withdraw from the trade unions, refuse to work in them, and create new and artificial forms of labor organization. This is so unpardonable a blunder that it is tantamount to the greatest service communists could render the bourgeoisie. To refuse to work in the reactionary trade unions means leaving the insufficiently developed or backward masses of workers under the influence of the reactionary leaders, the agents of the bourgeoisie, the labor aristocrats." Lenin recognizes that the labor aristocracy is a much bigger and more difficult challenge in Western countries. Now, what is the labor aristocracy? The labor aristocracy means leftist politicians, trade union leaders, and workers who have basically been bribed by the capitalists. This basically happens in two ways. There are politicians and trade union bureaucrats who receive a high salary from the capitalists, and as a result, they become basically hired agents of the bourgeoisie 
they support the capitalists because they get a lot of money. The other way that this can happen is that much bigger amounts of workers can be given some kind of concessions by the bourgeoisie, by the capitalists. They give the workers something, higher wages or whatever it may be, some kind of bribe, and they hope that that way those workers can be basically bought off and bribed into supporting capitalism. Lenin recognizes that this is a bigger problem in the West, in the Western imperialist countries, than it was in the Russian Empire. Because even though the Russian Empire was an imperialist country, it was semi-feudal and it was less developed. However, Lenin says that it would be completely wrong for communists to conclude, okay, the trade union leadership has been bribed, or even that the trade union members or the masses have been bribed, Therefore, I shouldn't try to convince them. I shouldn't try to organize them. Because what's the result of that? Well, then the result is that you just don't organize the masses. You leave the masses under the control of the labor aristocrats and under reactionaries and capitalists. Finland is a great example of a country where the trade unions are under the control of corrupt, right-wing social democrat, labor aristocrat leaders. Finland is also a country where the workers have a comparatively comfortable standard of living. Finnish workers have much better living standards than workers in Africa, for instance. As a result, it's naturally a lot more difficult to organize these workers to oppose capitalism and potentially even become communists. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I can't really go into them right now, but the point is that even though it is more difficult, that's not an excuse we still have to do it. There's no other way. There's no easy or simple way to do it. There's no life hack, how to hack the revolution. No, nobody said it was going to be easy. Lenin continues, quote, This ridiculous theory that communists should not work in reactionary trade unions reveals with the utmost clarity the frivolous attitude of the left communists towards the question of influencing the masses and their misuse of clamor about the masses. If you want to help the masses and win the sympathy and support of the masses, you should not fear difficulties or pinpricks, chicanery, insults, and persecution from the leaders, but must absolutely work wherever the masses are to be found. You must be capable of any sacrifice, overcoming the greatest obstacles, in order to carry on agitation and propaganda systematically, perseveringly, persistently and patiently in those institutions, societies, and associations even the most reactionary, in which proletarian or semi-proletarian masses are to be found. Unquote. So Lenin's position is actually the complete opposite of the left communist position. If it's an organization that has reactionary leaders, that's a reason to go in there. Because if there's masses there, you have to go in and organize them. Otherwise, you're, you'll leave them under the influence of the reactionaries. Now, when we talk about organizations and institutions, we are talking about trade unions, insurance funds or mutual help societies, food banks, civil rights groups, just any kind of uh, mass political organizations, or even organizations that are not super political, like uh, organizations of students or organizations of pensioners, citizens groups, whatever they may be, those are mass organizations and in those kinds of organizations, you should go in there and try to organize people. However, what we are not talking about is we're not talking about, like, fascist political parties. You should not go into a fascist party or into some kind of tiny far-right group and then try to recruit them. That's a waste of time. Those people are not the masses. They are a small handful of convinced and committed reactionaries. Now, Lenin concludes this chapter by just sort of elaborating some of these points a little bit more. So he says, quote, millions of workers are for the first time passing from a complete lack of organization to the elementary, lowest, simplest, and to those still thoroughly imbued with bourgeois democratic prejudices, most easily comprehensible form of organization, namely the trade unions. Yet the revolutionary but imprudent left communists stand by crying out to the masses, the masses, but refusing to work within the trade unions on the pretext that they are reactionary and invent a brand new immaculate little workers' union 
which is guiltless of bourgeois democratic prejudices, a union which they claim will be a broad organization, recognition of the Soviet system and the dictatorship will be the only condition of membership, unquote. So here Lenin is just sort of making fun of them, because one of these left communist groups said that, oh yeah, we'll start a revolutionary communist labor union, and it's going to be a broad organization. Well, that's ridiculous. Of course it's not going to be a broad organization. If only communists can join it, it's going to exclude all the non-communist workers. And then this left communist group stated that, oh no, don't worry, the only criteria that you have to accept in order to be allowed into our revolutionary union is that you just have to recognize the Soviet system and the dictatorship of the proletariat. And Lenin is just making fun of that because can you imagine if in order to join a trade union you have to accept like, oh yeah, best way to organize society is the Soviet system, and by the way, I also support and accept the dictatorship of the proletariat and nothing else. That is not a very easy criteria. That means that literally only communist sympathizers can join. And that's why Lenin says that uh, it would be hard to imagine any greater ineptitude or greater harm to the revolution than that caused by the so-called left revolutionaries. Why, if we in Russia today after two and a half years of unprecedented victories over the bourgeoisie of Russia and the Entente, were to make recognition of the dictatorship a condition of the trade union membership, we would be doing a very foolish thing, damaging our influence among the masses and helping the Mensheviks. Unquote. Even in Soviet Russia, it would be stupid to say that you can only join the trade union if, to, if you say that the dictatorship of the proletariat is the best thing. It's just absurd. The dictatorship of the proletariat is a Marxist concept, and it's a concept of political science. To just be able to join a trade union, why do you have to know what a dictatorship of the proletariat is? The left communists understand the purpose of a trade union much differently than Lenin does. Lenin sees trade unions as an organization which mainly just thinks of uh, immediate economic interest of the workers in relation to their workplace. And then that can be used, getting workers introduced into political activity and uh, organized activity. But left communists, they don't see it that way. They think that the union must be something much more than that. Something much more similar to the communist party. But what's the point? You already have the communist party. Why would the union need to do the same stuff that the communist party does? In fact... If you start to confuse the union and the communist party, then you're actually just causing damage because the trade union is supposed to be an introduction into organized activity, but if you create very challenging criteria for people, then they just can't join and they will never get that introduction into organization. Lenin says that, quote, The leaders of opportunism will no doubt resort to every device of bourgeois diplomacy and to the aid of bourgeois governments, the clergy, the police and the courts to keep communists out of trade unions, oust them by every means. And by the way, we have seen this happen countless times in history and also today. Make their work in the trade unions as unpleasant as possible and insult, bait and persecute them. We must be able to stand up to all this, agree to make any sacrifice, and even, if need be, to resort to various stratagems, to evasions and subterfuges, as long as we get into the trade unions, remain in them and carry on communist work within them at all costs. So, to Lenin, the idea of voluntarily just abandoning trade unions is absurd. The capitalists and the opportunists who serve them They try to make the trade unions act a certain way. And if somebody, such as the communists, try to make the trade unions act a different way, the capitalists immediately see it as a threat. But the left communists, they just want to abandon all that to the capitalists. Like, no, 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 let the capitalists have the trade unions, let them control them, and through them, control the working class. Just a couple examples from the history of the Finnish communist movement. For instance, the original... Finnish Trade Union Federation, the communists had a majority influence over it for a long time. And as a result, the government, together with uh, right-wing social democrats and fascists, actually banned 
outlawed and dismantled the Finnish Trade Union Federation in 1930, but the communists had been able to gain majority influence in it. They didn't do that by creating a revolutionary union, no, they did that by trying to organize in the already existing normal union, and it was successful, but unfortunately the fascists destroyed it. After that, for a little while, the communists tried to organize an underground red trade union, but that was abandoned because nobody wanted to join it. According to some books, the membership of their underground red trade union was even smaller than the underground communist party, so it was very difficult to get people to join that. So instead, what the communists did was they, again, joined the existing union. There was a new right-wing social democrat union that had been created, called the Finnish Central Federation of Labor, or something along those lines. It was totally controlled by the right-wing social democrats, and the whole point of that organization had been to replace the previous one, which had been mainly run by the communists. But the communists then successfully joined into that, and again started to have influence. And here Lenin ends the chapter by telling a pretty similar story. Quote, Under Tsarism, we had no legal opportunities whatsoever until 1905. However, when Zubatov, agent of the secret police, organized black hundred workers' assemblies and working men's societies for the purpose of trapping revolutionaries and combating them, we sent members of our party to those assemblies and into these societies. So, Zubatov was a guy in the Tsarist secret police who created black hundred unions, and uh, if you don't know, the black hundreds were these far-right anti-Semitic monarchists. So the Tsarist secret police created its own unions so that they could get revolutionaries to join them and then they could arrest them. That was the whole point of these unions. And these were the only legal unions at the time. They were basically a trap. But the Bolsheviks still sent their people in to join those. And then what happened? They established contacts with the masses, were able to carry on their agitation, and succeeded in arresting workers from the influence of Zubatov's agents. So even in that case, it turned out to be a good idea to send some people in there, because that was a way of getting influence over the masses. Of course, it was very risky and very dangerous, but still. 